it looks like we have a few moments left. If uh, anybody has any questions for our speakers this morning or uh, about their particular topics or just questions about the Institute or economics generally, I'm sure we could come up with something. There's an online question. Okay. Submitted by someone. Um, one of the students watching online asks, uh, when did inflation begin and uh, why did it begin? And Rothbard talks about um, some of the historical inflation um, that the Fed hasn't been around forever and we haven't, they haven't had the, the kind of um, uh, fiat control that the government has now. Um, instead, what happened is um, that uh, Rothbard talks about in a great, uh, a great essay called What Has Government Done to Our Money? That's a really great, uh, a great essay to read. And he talks about debasement. So he says, debasement was the state's method of counterfeiting the very coins it had banned private firms from making. Um, so the, it declared a monopoly on coinage. Uh, sometimes the government committed simple fraud, secretly diluting gold with a base alloy, making short weight coins. More characteristically, the mint melted and recoined all the coins of the realm, giving the subjects back the same number of, quote, pounds or marks or what we would say now dollars, but of a lighter weight. The leftover ounces of gold or silver were pocketed by the king and used to pay his expenses. Um, so that's the way um, government used to profit that's from inflation. That's a heck of a great question, or was that not all part of the question? <laughs> Anybody in our live audience here with a question? Well, Mark, do you want to talk about the inflation in history? Or? Well, if we had another question. Okay. Yeah, that, just the first part of what I said in the question. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's your perception of Bitcoin and, and how that's being introduced as far as, you know, the, an exchange mechanism? <laughs> All right, Bitcoin, I'll let Mark handle that, and we ought to be done in, by about six tonight. <laughs> No, I'll, I'll try to keep it short. Um, I'll try to keep it short. Uh, Bitcoin is a new digital form of currency, um, and it has many uh, interesting characteristics about it that we're, you know, kind of thrilled about. Um, in one sense, it's, it's non-governmental money. It was uh, something that was an idea of a single person, and it's through a, a market-type process uh, it's emerged as a as a way of uh, of making transactions, basically. Uh, and one uh, aspect of Bitcoin is that you actually have to expend real resources, computing power and electricity, in order to solve algorithms in order to earn Bitcoin. And so that part of Bitcoin, the idea that um, you know that you, real resources have to go into it in order to make more Bitcoins. That's a market form of money in the sense that, uh, like gold and silver, you would actually have to dig up the gold and silver ore and go through a process which ultimately resulted in gold and silver coins. And so there's a check on the amount of money that can be made through the Bitcoin process. Uh, and so there, it's very difficult to have inflation, especially the type of inflation that we're talking about here, where the government can essentially just let the printing presses roll with more zeros on it. Um, and so in Bitcoin is also, we weren't surprised to see it come precisely at this time because the governments of the world and their central banks are inflating uh, like crazy. And so um, the fact that it emerged at this point in time in history is not a, just a simple coincidence. Uh, it's a reaction against the... Um, the bad qualities of government fiat money. So um, just a few more remarks about Bitcoin. Um, not only um, um, it, are there limits uh, like what Mark talked about, but there's also a hard upper limit that, that um, there's a certain number of Bitcoins that the program won't allow itself to, to expand uh, beyond. And uh, one, of, uh, one of the presenters at the Austrian Economics Research Conference, which is a great conference that we have here every year, uh, Matt Gilliland, he gave a presentation about Bitcoin, and he also talked about another, uh, a use value 
of Bitcoin because Austrians, we don't, we don't say that the cost of production gives something value. Uh, rather, it's the value of what's of the product that, that gives value to the, to the things that were put into producing it. And Matt Gilliland talks about how Bitcoin can be used uh, for property transfer. So it, um, it can be used for contracts for the uh, non-third party contracts. And so he talks about that, um, that sort of legal service as being a, a, a use value of Bitcoin. But you know, a, a, a sort of fundamental point is, uh, you know, Bitcoin is being used today as a medium of exchange to facilitate certain transactions, but it has not yet become, or it is not, a, a commonly accepted medium of exchange. You can't walk to Mama Goldberg's deli next door and buy her lunch with Bitcoin. So we would say Bitcoin is not presently money because money is a commonly accepted or generally accepted medium of exchange. But it is used as a medium of exchange in some transactions and it may well become money someday. We have a question in the back. My question is to the rarity of it. it, it it seems to me that the only way that that's rare in any real meaningful sense is if nobody else starts their own Bitcoin system. If everybody started their, designed their own Bitcoin system, you wouldn't know which one to use and it wouldn't be rare in, in any meaningful way. Yeah. Is that correct? Well, I mean, keep in mind with any kind of medium of exchange, Mark mentioned seashells, cattle. I mean, there are a lot of times and places in history where different alternative media of exchange have been traded within the same geographic area. And there are certain advantages to standardizing on one or the other. But just as, for example, you know, throughout history, not only gold, but also silver have typically functioned as, as monetary units, as money. So you could imagine lots of entrepreneurs experimenting with different kinds of digital currencies and other kinds of non-digital currencies. And if consumers decide that there are advantages to standardizing on one as opposed to another, we would expect one to sort of outcompete the other. So there's no reason why you couldn't have multiple competing digital currencies. Right here? Yeah, if, if, if one were to believe the government numbers, inflation is uh, pretty minimal, but just personally, buying groceries on a weekly basis and eating out a lot less frequently than I used to, I, I would just guess that my prices have gone up 30% in the last, you know, four or five years. Ago. And I, I guess my question is, uh, what are they measuring? How do you reconcile the difference? And where, where can you see what real inflation is? Where can you go to see what... Real well, that's a great question. The fact that um, the government's printing up a lot of money, and yet the consumer price index that the government calculates is not going up much at all. But of course, that wouldn't be too surprising. I mean, if you had a crooked game to begin with, and you're keeping score, you're going to tell everybody that they're doing fine. Um, in the real world, of course, prices, you know, the money gets into the system, and the prices uh, change. This is one of the things that uh, Danny was talking about and Peter was talking about. It depends on where the money is coming in and how it impacts prices. So, for example, Manhattan and Washington, D.C. real estate prices are skyrocketing, you know, to record levels. Uh, the stock market and the bond market are at all time record levels right now. So some people are making, you know, tremendous gains the price of farmland is at record levels. And so some things have really, really skyrocketed and uh, other things have not. Uh, now, in terms of your own little consumer basket, of course, I think that the, the prices of consumer goods um, are going up. Uh, you know, they, for example, they'll very often report the consumer price index without food and energy. But of course, food and energy are kind of pretty important stuff and most people's uh, consumer basket of goods. Uh, in terms of looking at uh, another source where you could find information about price inflation, John Williams at shadowstats.com calculates the consumer price index using the uh, method of calculation back in the 1990s and the 1980s. And see, the government basically, where they change the rules of how they calculate this, on a periodic basis, 
And so if you go back and you look at the old ways that they calculated it, the prices of goods and services, consumer goods and services, have increased um, much faster than the current way that they're doing it. So if you've got a crooked game and you're keeping score and you can change the way you score the game, uh, don't depend on those kind of numbers. Yeah. I always think it's funny that uh, you hear the Federal Reserve officials say, oh, we're wor really worried about inflation, we're, we're keeping a close eye on the CPI, but thank goodness house prices are going up again. And we've got a robust recovery in the housing market. What that means is price inflation of houses. So it's a bad thing, they say, if the prices of tomatoes are going uh, uh, rise, but it's a good thing if the price of houses rises. Well, that's inflation. And if you're looking to buy a house, an increase in house prices is not good for you. And I would just add that deflation, the opposite of inflation, can be a very good thing for consumers. James Grant, you might have heard of him from Grant's Interest Rate Observer, was recently here at Mises giving a speech about Henry Hazlitt, and he remarked that deflation can be seen as progress. In other words, uh, most of us like it when the cost of that big screen TV goes from $3,000 to $500, and that's a result of a lot of different things. But nonetheless, if we, are to de if we define deflation as, uh, I, I guess broadly, as a decrease in consumer prices that happens faster than a decrease in corresponding wages, then that's a healthy and happy thing for most folks. Um, so the idea that the Fed targets, in effect, a particular rate of inflation, uh, whether that's 2% or, or not, um, and thinking that this has no harm uh, on society. If you, if you look at compounding interest, if you look at savers, if you look at especially uh, elderly folks who oftentimes have a fixed income in nominal dollars and you know if, if you're older you might not have the ability to sort of retool your life and go out and make a bunch of money or change careers or, or, or otherwise uh, increase your income you might be very dependent on the fixed income sources you've got when you're 80 years old and so it's it's these people uh, who are who are counting on their savings and their fixed nominal income to get them through their later years who are perhaps most hurt by inflation and that gets uh, one thing I meant to say in my talk, but I forgot, is that um, the people who benefit from inflation are, are often pretty rich people. So when I was talking about how people wouldn't like if they knew that wealth was being transferred away from them and towards other people, well, especially if they realized how rich the people that were getting the wealth were. So, so the privileged bankers are often uh, really well off. And <laughs> it's your fault. <laughs> and... And, the, um, and the, the, the people who get the money earlier are, are usually better off. And even debtors, you would, people often think that, oh, de debtors, they must be poorer than sa savers. But actually, it's these investors who are leveraged, who are heavily leveraged and build up all this debt to, to make these big bets that, that they're the ones who benefit, these rich, rich investors. And, um, and like, like Jeff said, a lot of times it's these people, these poorer people who are on fixed incomes that get hurt the worst. Question here. Since we have basically the facts that socialism can't work because it does require private property and freedom and free markets and stuff like that, why do we have politicians and economists saying that that's the way to go when we know we can't go that way? Well, I would say, it's for starters, socialism works for the political class. It doesn't work for everybody else, but I'll let our esteemed PhDs elaborate. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a very good question. I mean, I'm tempted to say because they haven't taken this course, which, <laughs> which you have. But as Jeff points out, there, there are private interests that benefit from socialism and interventionism. I mean, if you look at the, you know, uh, so-called Affordable Care Act, right? I mean, there are a lot of, uh, a, a lot of analysts who, say the, who see this as a, 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 making a bad situation worse. Um, it sounds like socialized medicine or whatever, but of course the insurance companies are benefiting tremendously from Obamacare. Some doctors and hospitals will benefit from Obamacare. I mean, there are always private interests that benefit from any interventionist, that benefit from interventions in the economy, not to mention the class of socialist leaders who benefit from economy-wide socialism. But it's also fair to point out that economics is uh, difficult for some people to understand. 
and what seems to a lot of us like fairly straightforward principles, really common sense, um, is, these principles are easily twisted and distorted. Um, I mean, I would say if you listen to us, I mean, you know, we're clear as a bell, right? What we say makes perfect sense. We don't use a lot of fancy jargon words, and we don't put up a lot of confusing charts and diagrams. But the average person in society who holds the title economist, right, is someone you would never invite to a dinner party in a million years. They're boring, and they, they're confusing, and they use weird terminology. It's completely unclear. And so I think a lot of people just don't understand. They've been misled into thinking that, well, of course, we need the government to, uh, uh, to intervene in, in, in markets. I mean, after all, it's the Affordable Care Act. If we don't have this, we won't have affordable health care. And Tom, did you have a question? Um, what solutions do you all have to uh, any inflation return to some monetary policy? Have you all adopted what Brock Brock laid out in the case for the new cent gold dollar? Or do you, if so, do you have any possible critiques or just how to end inflation? Well, that's, that's, uh, that's sort of a hundred year march through history kind of question. But a, a short answer and, a, and a, a viable short-term solution would be simply for the American people to develop the political will to force Congress to allow competing currencies. In other words, without getting rid of the Federal Reserve, without getting rid of the US dollar, we could, the, it, it, we could simply allow American people to conduct business, to go to 7-Eleven or Mama Goldberg's, and, and use forms of money other than US dollars and not go to prison for doing that. And that, I think, very quickly, you would find uh, a marketplace for uh, gold and silver coins that had a uniform weight and measure. They wouldn't be num numismatic or pretty necessarily, but they would be very functional. And I think very quickly, you would find sort of a parallel uh, market developed for money. And then we could find out if the Fed is right, and if the Keynesians are right, and if the monetarists are right, and we can increase money and, and basically, in effect, print dollars forever and ever, and the rest of the, and never get poor or have a collapse as a result of doing it, well, then they can continue to do so and prove us wrong. But if they're wrong, then we can offer the American people a, a chance to save themselves before something horrible happens by having gold, silver, or whatever it might be. It, it could be Bitcoin. Um, it could be another cryptocurrency. I don't know. I suspect it would be gold and silver because, because coins are something that are tangible and they just make sense to us. We all, we all get it. And so I think consumers and merchants would sort of have a comfort level with that. But um, again, legalize competing currencies. That, that would be my three-word answer after that long answer I just gave you. And um, one other point is that probably the most effective way of making that happen is not to actually call your congressman or, uh, um, or do anything like that, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but to do what we're doing today, to, to spread um, the ideas about sound economics and sound money. Because what happens is that the more people understand um, the, the less they're willing to, um, to put up with these restrictions. And, and it, if government just knows that, that they, they need to you know, withdraw some of these um, restrictions uh, because people are just going to you know, start using Bitcoin or, or start using, using gold dollars on, on the edge. And the, the, the more that, that people are just clamoring for a change, and the more that just people understand the, the need for change, then the more that change will actually happen. I just tie it up by noting that Austrian economists generally fly under the banner of the gold standard. That doesn't necessarily mean we advocate everybody use gold money or everybody use silver money or that we even necessarily have to have coin money. I mean, it could still be debit cards and credit cards and checkbooks and and all the rest of the you know, improvements in the transaction system that we have in the economy. But we just generally refer to that as going back to the gold standard. I think we have time for one more question before we get you on your way. Any volunteers in the front? My question relates to what you spoke about. The way to talk about these things is to, uh, to educate, educate the public. And so I try to do that. I'm a novice. I'm a biologist, not an economist. 
Um, what would you recommend if, if someone does show an interest? How should we start them? Like, what reading, pamphlets, essays? Because nobody's going to sit down and read a book on economics in my sphere. There, there's very little time. But I have people who are interested, and I want to point them to the right things. Because sometimes you can point people to things and they go running like mad. Like, you all are, are crazy or fringe. So, what do you recommend? I was started on the law, and I never looked back after that. So, what, what do you guys recommend? Maybe a top five? Or well, it sounds like we need a, a gateway drug. Yeah. <laughs> I mean... The law is, of course, excellent. Um, Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson, which is, what, almost 60 years old now, is still excellent, specifically on money. Um, I would recommend Rothbard's What Has Government Done to Our Money, um, which is a short pamphlet uh, that's easy to read. Um, he, we, there are longer treatments, like Rothbard's Mystery of Banking, that are very good. All of these are available uh, free online, most of these at Mises.org. Um, what are some other intro readings that Case would be good? Cents. Case for $100. Yeah, Murray Rothbard has, you know, what has government done to our money, the case for the 100% um, gold standard, and the, and the case against the Fed. So there's three small things. Uh, but you can also do things like um, put these lectures up on Facebook, uh, put them up on Twitter, um, like us on Facebook. We're, getting, we're very close to getting 100,000 likes on our Facebook page, but if you go out and put up on a regular basis material that you find interesting and informative at Mises.org, including the daily articles, you know, read that daily article and say, now what of my friends or relatives would be most interested in that? You can be starting one person at a time to change the world. Oh yeah, and I would recommend to all of you who are interested in helping to convert and move people in the right direction. Joe Salerno's class. Joe is the really the number one money macro guy in Austrian economics, and he has a Mises Academy class uh, starting Tuesday the 15th. So we all know April 15th is a bad day, but this is the good part of it. It's a start on the road to sound money, and it's called Understanding Monetary Chaos. Most people don't understand that the world is in a tremendous sense in a monetary chaos, we're in a world currency war where all the governments and central banks around the planet are battling one another to devalue their own currency and help their export industries vis-a-vis -vis other, um, uh, other countries' industries and exporters. And so Joe's course is really, um, you know, it's, he's going to lay the whole thing out. I'll be a guest lecturer uh, during the course as well. And so uh, I encourage everybody here and watching us uh, to sign up for that class. Folks, we have run out of time, but thank you very much for coming here today, spending your Friday with us. Drive home safe, and we all hope to see you again. Thanks.